Welcome back. We will continue our look at Canute and his empire. We start on page 16. Some indication of the peace enjoyed by the country under Canute's firm hand is the meagerness of the entries in the chronicle following the first year of his accession. Part, apart from ecclesiastical affairs, they are almost all concerned with his expeditions abroad. As Stenton remarks, his reign was so successful that contemporaries found little to say about it. For the first year he ruled with rigor, through the medium of his four lieutenants, whom he had rewarded with earldoms, which in the period up to the Norman conquest were to grow into regional centers of power governed by powerful magnates like Godwin, whose influence and ambition not even the king himself could curb. Before August of the same year, Knut strengthened his grip on the throne by commanding, as the chronicle puts it, that the widow of the late King Ethelred, daughter of Richard of Normandy, should be brought to him so that she might become his wife. In order, as William of Malmesbury suggests, by giving him new nephews to look after, to reduce any enthusiasm which Duke Richard might have for the cause of Emma's sons by her first husband. Alastair Campbell makes his shrewd comment. The object of Canute's marriage was a reconciliation with Normandy rather than with the English and one may doubt whether the English regarded Emma with sufficient affection to feel any enthusiasm for the astonishing recovery of her former position as queen, much less to change their feelings towards their conqueror on her account. Before he married Ethelred's widow, Emma, Canute had had an earlier connection of a doubtful kind, as Freeman describes it with Elfigiu, Elfgifu, the daughter of the Northumbrian Earl Elfhelm, usually described as Elfgifu of Northampton, probably because her father had estates in that country. She was undoubtedly an attractive woman of great force of character, for she maintained her position as Canute's mistress throughout the whole of his reign, and bore him two sons, Harold and Svein. In 1030, Canute appointed her to act as his regent in Norway on Svein's behalf, but her harsh rule earned them both the hatred of their subjects. Some chroniclers give her the title of wife, possibly confusing her with Emma, the queen who had taken the name Elfgifu when she had to become Ethelred's bride. Others speak plainly of her as Canute's concubine, while Saxo says she had already been St. Olaf's mistress, and that the long comradeship of Olaf and Canute had been broken when Canute dis seduced her. One American historian, in particular, does not help us much to clarify her status by saying she was never Canute's wife, but then, in the 11th century, vague ideas ruled concerning the marriage relation, even among Christians. However that may be, Emma took the sensible precaution before consenting to become Knut's queen of insisting on the exclusion of her rival's children from the royal succession after Knut's death. By 1018, so secure did Knut reckon himself to be that all but 40 of his ships were sent home to Denmark, and not empty-handed, for he was strong enough to demand a levy of 72,000 in Anglo-Saxon values for their payoff, not counting an extra 10,000 from the citizens of London. In the same year, he gave evidence that the well-being of the nation was of primary concern to him by the enactment of a code of laws whose statutes derived mainly from the earlier codes of Edgar and Ethelred. It is probable that this code, a kind of first draft of later codes, was drawn up at, 
at Knut's request by the veteran Archbishop Wolfstan, whom he appears not only to have admired for his sanctity and legal acumen, but also to have respected for his loyal support of Ethelred and for his forthright condemnation of the disorders of the late king's reign. The council met at Oxford, the archbishop no doubt being present, to order or enact laws which the preface describes as devised according to many good precedents. Moreover, as the drafting of the code must have taken some time, we have evidence almost from the outset of his reign that the king had taken action to ensure that at least a framework of future codes was prepared for promulgation without delay. In reading the various records which describe his reign and character, one rarely receives the impression that Canute at any time during his career deliberately made up his mind to play the game of power politics in order to win for himself an extensive empire across the northern seas. As long as his brother Harold ruled in Denmark, it is unlikely that any such ambition influenced his mind or his policies, and his subsequent interventions in Norwegian affairs seem mostly prompted by the importunities of those Norwegians who had fled to his court from St. Olaf's tyranny. It is true, too, of course, that the Olofsjord area had long been counted a sphere of Danish interest. At home, too, he did not interfere in Scottish affairs until compelled to do so. Although provoked by the seizure of Lothian to lead an army into Scotland, he did not replace Malcolm by one of his earls, but was content with the Scottish king's recognition of his overlordship. Had he wished it, the most obvious path to a greater domination would have been into the Baltic, in active rivalry with the Swedes, if necessary. Such a move would have protected his trade routes and strengthened his position against the Holy Roman emperors who had long threatened the southern frontier of Denmark, even as far as Danework north of the natural boundary, the River Eider. It was perhaps characteristic of the way the course of events usually ran in his favor, that he was able to secure these benefits not by warfare, but by cultivating the friendship of Conrad, whose coronation took place whilst he was on his pilgrimage there. Just as it is false in M. Louis Halpin's opinion, to regard Charlemagne as a great politician who planned and perfected his grand designs before embarking on his enterprises, so too it is probably wrong to suppose that Canute's actions were dictated by any consistent poli policy of aggrandizement. They were rather those of an opportunist, one not particularly gifted with acumen and political sense, to be able to anticipate the turn of events, but decisive in action in pursuit of his interests when opportunity arose and the situation demanded it. The compiler of Kintlinga Saga had a flash of insight in speaking of Canute's victories when he added, he was a man of great luck in everything connected with power. The various versions of the Anglo-Saxon chronicle record four separate expeditions which Canute undertook to Scandinavia within ten years. The first was undertaken in 1019, and some indication of its purpose can be gathered from one part of a letter, which Canute dispatched to Earl Thorkel, who was acting as Canute's regent in his absence. He speaks of approaching dangers, which I have taken measures to prevent, so that never henceforth shall hostility reach you from there as long as you support me rightly and my life shall last. Harold, Canute's brother, who had been ruling as king of Denmark, had just died, and it is possible that the purpose of Canute's visit to Denmark was to take possession of his throne before power could fall into the hands of those of Harold's 
House Carls, who might in time have felt tempted to renew Danish attacks on England. However, in 1021, Thorkel was outlawed. For what reason, we are not told. The Anno in 1023 opens with the surprising statement that Canute returned to England and Thorkel and he were reconciled. This is the second visit, and no explanation of Canute's presence in Denmark is offered. It has been conjectured that Thorkel had gone to Denmark after his exile with the purpose of provoking Danish adventures into an attack on England, and that Canute's concentration of his fleet off the Isle of Wight before his departure for Denmark is to be explained as a precaution to protect the southern coast against possible raids by Thorkel and his allies. At all events, Thorkel and Knut were reconciled before the latter's departure from Denmark, and the Abingdon Chronicle for 1023 records that Knut delivered Denmark and his son into Thorkel's keeping and took Thorkel's son with him to England. As Hartha Knut was still in England on 8 June that year, it has been conjectured that it was Harold, Canute's second son, who was sent to Denmark. But it is more probable that Hartha Canute was sent to Thorkel sometime towards the end of 1023 or later. Nothing is known of Thorkel after this incident, and Denmark was put under the regency of Ulf Thorgilson, Canute's brother in law, who conspired with Queen Emma to put Hartha Canute on the Danish throne. In Fargskrina, it says that Emma got hold of Canute's seal and caused a letter to be sealed with it, ordering the Danes to make her son king of Denmark. For the motivation of Canute's third expedition to Scandinavia, which led to the battle at the Holy River, one can turn to Snorri Sturluson narrative and persuasive political analysis in the Heimskringla. Snorri not only records history but also reflects on it by imaginative use of beguiling anecdote or terse piece of dialogue. He is able to animate the scene and provide that dramatic illumination of character and action which so far has been lacking in the bald accounts of those Latin and Anglo-Saxon chronicles, on which we have mostly had to rely. After he has described the fall of Olaf Tryggvason, in the gallant defense of his dragon ship Long Serpent in the sea fight of Svold, Snorri tells us how Norway was divided up between the three leaders who had defeated him. King Olaf of Sweden, King Svein of Denmark, and Earl Eric, son of Earl Hakan or Halder, and how Olaf Haraldsson, later known as Saint Olaf, had gradually brought the whole of Norway under his control by intrigue and by bringing pressure to bear on the pre petty kings up country who still continued to maintain local authority. Some of them lived the lives of yeomen, farmers, and were content to acknowledge the Swedish or Danish kings as their overlords so long as payment of tribute left their independence undisturbed. As Snorri illustrates by a delightful story of one of them, Olaf's stepfather, Sigurd Sir, who was out in the fields haymaking in his working clothes when Olaf arrived to solicitate his, solicit his support. Asta, Olaf's mother, ambitious for her son, hastily sends men off to the fields with royal robes, with a peremptory message to her husband to put them on and try to look like his ancestor, the great Harald the Fairhaired, instead of behaving like a country farmer disgracing his family. And thus admonished, the king sits down and his shoes pulled off and dons cordovan hose and gilded spurs. He takes off his working clothes and is clad in fine raiment with a scarlet coupe. He girds on a costly sword, sets a gilded helmet on his head, and mounting a horse, 
with ornamented saddle, proceeds in state out of the field to greet his ambitious stepson. Little is known of Swedish affairs at this time, but Snorri dwells at length on the attempts made by leading Norwegians to reconcile the two Olafs, the king of Norway and the king of Sweden, by marrying Ingerder, the daughter of the Swedish king, to the Norwegian Olaf. The lady herself was anxious for the marriage, and one day finding her obdurate father in good spirits gives him a forthright lecture on the political situation. What intentions have you about the hostility between you and Olaf? Many men are now lamenting this strife. Some say that they have lost goods and some have lost kinsmen through the Norsemen, and none of your men can go into Norway under these conditions. It was very unlucky that you laid claim to the kingdom of Norway. That land is poor and bad to cross, and the folk not to be trusted. The men in that land would rather have anyone for their king but you. Now, if I might counsel, you should leave off claiming Norway and rather extend your influence in the Baltic, for that realm which the early, earlier Swedish kings had, and which Strybjorn recently brought under his rule. But let Olaf have the land of his inheritance and make peace with him. <coughs> But the Swedish king was obdurate, and on another occasion told his daughter that he could never be the friend of a man who had taken his kingdom as war booty and had done him such great harm in robbery and manslaughter. He was soon to regret his words, for Saint Olaf secretly married Ingerdr's sister, and her father's chief chieftains confronted the Swedish king with an alternative, either that he should make peace with his namesake or else they would go against him and slay him, reminding him that at the Morathing, five kings were pitched into a well for being as haughty as he was to them now. Finally, he was deposed in favor of his son, Onund. He died in 1022. While the rulers of Norway and Sweden were at in enmity, Canute had no fears that the balance of power in Scandinavian world would be upset, and that, or that his own dominant position as master of England and Denmark could be menaced. But now that the rulers of Norway and Sweden, Olaf and Onund, were brothers-in-law, an alliance between them became a very real possibility. And Ulf's disloyalty in conspiring to put Hartha Knut on the Danish throne was an added cause for anxiety. Perhaps for these reasons, rather than Snorri suggests, because Knut's ambition led him to remember that his grandfather, Harald Gormundsson, had held Norway after the fall of Harald Greycloak and had taken tribute from it. Knut began to bribe many disaffected Norwegians to influence opinion in their country in his favor. Some of them had visited England to complain of Olaf's tyranny, and the richness of Knut's royal apartments thronged with courtiers was not altogether lost upon them. Their magnificence surpassed anything to be seen in Norway. Knut sent a delegation to King Olaf to announce that he would graciously permit Olaf to rule Norway as his vassal if he would first come to England to pay him homage. Saint Olaf's scathing reply is well known. Now he claims my inheritance. He ought to know some bounds to his ambition. Does he think to rule alone over all the north? Does he think alone to eat all the cabbage in England? Even this will he accomplish sooner than I shall bring him my head or show him any reverence whatsoever. His overtures to Olaf having failed, Knut now sent gifts to the king of Sweden to persuade him to be neutral in any future clash with Norway. But his messengers got no satisfaction because the brothers-in-law had met and agreed to form an alliance to attack Danish territory in Skane and Sjaldan. 
Knut thereupon sailed from England with a great fleet and came to Limfjord, where he dealt firmly with his foolish son, as he called him, who wanted to be king. His enemies and kings of Norway and Sweden had concentrated their forces at the mouth of the holy river in South Sweden, where he came up with them after sailing through the Kattegat. Accounts of the battle differ, and the date probably summer 1026 is in dispute. Snorri tells how Knut's ships in the harbor were almost swamped by the waves and battered by logs of trees when Olaf burst a dam which he had constructed across the river for that purpose. Knut's great dragon ship was driven out by the stream. It was not easy to, to turn it with the oars, so that it was driven out to the enemy's fleet. But for Ulf, Ulf, Knut's regent in Denmark, Knut's vessel would have been captured. Saxo, however, has quite a different story and attributes Knut's failure to Ulf, whom he describes as enticing Knut's men to destruction by encouraging them to cross a bridge which was unsafe. Ulf flees and is executed by Knut's orders. Neither version of the battle is very convincing, and while the Norse poet Otar the Black ascribes the victory to Knut, the Saxon chronicle under the Annal for 1025 gives it to the Swedes and makes Ulf an ally of the Swedes. What seems clear is that the fleets disengage as soon as they could, Olaf and the Swedish king returning to their domains, while Knut went to stay at Ulf, with Ulf at Roskilde in Seljan, Sjalland. Snorri describes how the earl was eager to entertain Knut and very happy, but the king was silent and not at all friendly, but agreed to a game of chess. Although quarrels over a chessboard are a recurring motif in early story, this is one worth repetition because it may provide an insight into the less attractive, implacable side of Knut's character. Magnanimous as he was to those proud enemies of his who surrendered to him, he was not only on occasion quick to anger and impetuously cruel, but also at times cold-bloodedly vindictive and without mercy or scruple to traitors or turncoats. And when King Knut and Earl Ulf were playing chess, the king made a bad move, and the earl then took a knight from him. The king put his piece back and said he should play another move. The earl grew angry, angry and threw down the chessboard and got up and went away. Then the king said, Are you running off, Ulf the coward? The earl turned round near the door and said, you would have run further at Holy River if you had been able. You didn't call me Ulf the coward when I came to your rescue, when the Swedes were beating you like dogs. Thereupon the earl left and went to sleep. A little after the king himself went to bed. Next morning when he was dressing, he said to his page, Go to Earl Ulf and slay him. The lad went and was away some time and then came back. Then the king said, Did you slay the earl? He answered, I did not slay him, for he had gone to St. Luke's church. There was a Norseman called Ivar the White who was in the king's bodyguard and slept in the king's house. To him the king said, Go thou and slay the earl. Ivar went to the church, into the choir, and there struck a sword through the earl, whereby Earl Ulf met his death. Ivar then went to the king with his bloody sword in his hand. The king asked, Did you slay the earl? Ivar answered, I have just killed him. You have done well then, said the king. In 1027, Canute made a pilgrimage to Rome and returned via Denmark. His last expedition, which was to make him master of Norway, was made in the next year. After St. Olaf fled across the mountains to Sweden, Forsaken by his earl and earls and by his people, Knut was acknowledged as king at Nidaros in Trondheim 
It was a bloodless and in some respects discreditable victory, since for years past Knut had been undermining Olaf's authority by bribery. Few of the Norwegians appear to have possessed the moral fiber to resist his bl blandishments, and many like Bjorn the Marshal, enticed by greed, as Snorri emphasizes, could not resist the lure of English silver poured into great heaps before their eyes. Florence of Worcester tells how the bribes were accepted with great avidity by the Norwegians, and there were few who heeded Sigvat, the poet's verses. The king's enemies are walking about with open purses. Men offer the heavy metal for the priceless head of the king. Everyone knows that he who takes gold for the head of his good lord has his place in the midst of black hell. It was a sad bargain in heaven when those who betrayed their lord went to the deep lying world of flaming fire. It was Canute's distinction as a ruler, as Stenton observes, that from the beginning of his reign he set himself to win the respect of the English church. His zeal for the Christian faith had none of the fanatical missionary ardor which possessed St. Olaf of Norway. Wordsworth's sonnet on Canute attempts an assessment of what was remarkable in the transformation of a ruthless Viking into a beneficent Christian king. Gospel truth is potent to ally fierceness and rage, and soon the cruel Dane feels, through the influence of her gentle reign, his native superstitions melt away. The sentiment has been translated into modern idiom by Professor Trevor Roper, who finds it impossible to conceive of the recreation of Europe in the Dark Ages without the Church. Without that doctrine whose unheroic content could yet subdue barbarian kings, Canute's pilgrimage to Rome in 1027 was made not only to reverence the tombs of the apostles and to visit many sanctuaries and holy places on the way, but also to secure political and commercial advantages for the nation by his presence at the coronation of Conrad II, the Holy Roman Emperor, whose frontiers bordered those of Denmark and with whom it was clearly advantageous to establish friendship. His letter to his people from foreign parts shows an understanding not always evident in royal personages of the importance of public relations, and reveals his flair for making the right imaginative gesture at the appropriate moment. He tells them of his mission and explains what he is endeavoring to accomplish on their behalf, and of the concessions he had been able to secure both for the clergy and for merchants making the journey to the holy city. He states that he has humbly vowed to Almighty God to amend his life from now on in all things, and as King of all England, Denmark, Norway, and part of Sweden, promises to rule justly and faithfully these kingdoms and maintain equal justice in all things. He sends ahead his letter in order that all people of his kingdom may be gladdened at his success, because, he writes, as you yourselves know, I have never spared, nor will I spare in the future, to devote myself and my toil for the need and benefit of all my people. <clears throat> Milton's cynical and capricious comment on this part of the letter is characteristic of his attitude to kings and the willful misunderstanding of Knut's motives. He says, It is fond a fond conceit in many great ones, and pernicious in the end, to cease from no violence till they have appeased the utmost of their ambitions and desires then to think God appeased by their seeking to bribe him with a share, however large, of their ill-gotten spoils, and then lastly to grow zealous of doing right. 
when they have no longer need to do wrong. Canute's acts of piety and his benefactions to the church were many and great. He gave his permissions for the translation of the remains of the murdered Archbishop Athelheath from St. Paul's to Christ Church, Canterbury, and the Saxon Chronicle records how with Emma, the Queen, and her royal son, Hartha Knut, and with great pomp and rejoicing and hymns of praise, they conveyed the holy Archbishop into Canterbury, and with equal ceremony brought him on 11 June to into Christ Church. He gave the port of Sandwich together with its harbor dues to Christ Church as some atonement for Ethelheath's death. And on the occasion of his return from Denmark, after his pilgrimage to Rome, he presented twelve white bearskins to the Abbey of Croyland, which the pseudo Ingolf Chronicle says remained before the different altars even to his day. Stenton, as I have said, has stressed the religious element in Knut's statesmanship, and how, a as a result of his obedience to the teaching of the Church, his rule in England came to be regarded through a haze of kindly tradition which obscured the fact that he was an alien king with an alien force always at his command. He is chiefly remembered today by the story of his rebuking the waves and by the verse which he is said to have composed on hearing the singing of the monks of Eli as he approached the monastery over the fins by boat. And other verses which follow, says the book of Eli, which even to the present time are still sung publicly in dances and remembered in the sayings of the wise. The story of the waves first told by Henry of Huntingdon, Huntingdon no doubt contains a folk tale motif, for a similar story is told of the Welsh prince Mel Gwyn to explain his advent to power as the result of a competition. To quote Professor Lloyd, not of arms, but of constructive skill. The contest with rival contestants came about on the sands of the estuary of the Dovi, and Maelgwyn owned his victory to a cunning artificer who provided him with a floating chair composed of wax rings. Since he alone was able to hold his ground against the incoming tide, before which his rivals had to flee. <coughs> Although Gaimar sets the scene for Canute at Westminster, it is possible, as has been suggested, that the scene of the incident was at the head of Chinchester Harbour, at the Bosham, perhaps, where Canute had a royal residence, and where one of his daughters, according to local tradition, was buried in the church. As one might expect, Milton is not much impressed by the incident, considering that to show the small power of kings in respect of God need no such laborious demonstration as Canute had contrived, unless maybe to shame court flatterers who would not else be convinced. He needed not to have gone wet shod home. The early English romance Havelock the Dane no doubt preserves vague recollections of a time when both England and Denmark were under the rule of a strong king who, as the poem describes, loved God and Holy Church, and in whose days good laws which he caused to be made were well kept. <clears throat> Henry Knighton's Chronicle of the 14th century also provides a link between Canute and the Havelock story. It was based on a little brute of Ralph de Boon, written earlier in the same century, and Canute appears as Havelock's son. Knighton's prose account is something of a Gilfamifri, in which Guy of Warwick and the giant Colbrand have their place. Havelock has fifteen children, 
all of whom die except four. Of interest to me, but not, I am sure, to my audience, is the fact that the senior boy bears the name Garmundus and is the heir apparent. Well, Canutus is to be made king of Dacia, presumably Denmark. Unfortunately, Garmundus breaks his neck when trying to manage a spirited horse. So after Havelock's death and burial in St. Paul's, Canutus comes from Denmark and rules with honor. On 12 November 1935, Canut died at the early age of 40 after ruling 19 years. By 1042, Canut's three sons were dead, and the throne passed to Edward the Confessor, Emma's son by Ethelred the Unready. Had Canute lived for three score years and ten, there would in all likelihood have been no Stamford Bridge and no Battle of Hastings. With what consequences for English history, who can say? He died at Shaftesbury and was buried at Winchester in the Old Minster. No finer epitaph could be found for him than the words of Sir Frank Stenton. He was the first Viking leader to be admitted into the civilized fraternity of Christian kings. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please subscribe.